Hey, friends. A lot of you guys requested that I tell some Waylon Jennings stories. And I think that's a pretty good idea. So today is the day, if you've been waiting for those. Everything that I'm going to tell you is stuff that is in this book right here. This is Waylon's autobiography written by Waylon Jennings and Lenny Kay. It was published in 1996, and it is very entertaining. It is, uh, this is, I have to say, I want to say this up front, this is not a how-to book. This is not a manual. This is not how you want to live your life or manage your career. This is more of a cautionary tale. He's really honest, and uh, it's refreshing. There's a lot to like about when you read these stories of Wayland behaving badly and his vices and things like that, the different situations he ended up in. He's pretty honest about it. There's a little bit of macho bravado every now and then. It's kind of a turnoff. But there's a line of honesty through it that I really enjoyed. And um, I don't know what this originally sold for. It was published in 1996. There's a sticker on the front. Somebody bought it from Half Price Books for $5.98. I bought it from a thrift store for $2. I'm cheap. We've talked about that a few times. But I want to focus today on Waylon's relationship, his friendship uh, with George Jones. Throughout this book, he talks about a lot of different people he was close to, but um, you know, George Jones was one of the people that he seemed to be able to relate to quite a lot, probably because of the personal vices, the ups and downs of the career, and all of that. But um, you know, he talks about meeting George when Waylon was a disc jockey, and he asked George if he liked bluegrass music, and George was like, hell no. He said that back back then... He could see George Jones becoming a rock and roll singer, and he thinks that he would have been really successful if he would have tried that, but George decided to go country. He said there was a there was a night on the Louisiana Hayride when Elvis was appearing on there. This is a big radio show, came out of the South, and um, George Jones had to play in front of Elvis, and he didn't want to be upstaged by Elvis. So George Jones played the rock and roll, and he did this really rockin' version of Little Richard's Long Tall Sally. And Waylon said he tore it up, and, you know, the crowd liked him better than Elvis that night. That's what Waylon says in the book. But as years went on, they became really close friends, and uh, there's a lot of stories about them getting drunk and partying together. I'm going to read you guys a little section of here. It's telling a story about a night that George Jones came over to Waylon's house, and was a little out of control drunk. This is Waylon talking. I'm always happy to help him remember some of his more cantankerous moments, like the evening he came over to visit on a spree and started flailing about in my living room, yelling at Mary Mann, Shooter's grandmother. When it looked as if he might go to sleep, I had the bright idea of giving him a big glass of whiskey to help him nod off. Wrong. He started tearing everything up. I ran into the room and he threw a metal frame picture at my head. It just missed me. If it had landed half a foot to the right, it would have knocked me cold for a week. I tried to get him to calm down, but he kicked me. Finally, I had to sit on him. He played possum on me once, which shows you how he got his nickname, pretending he was choking. When I let go and said, George, you all right? He hit me in the face. I didn't know how much longer this could go on. I was on drugs myself at the time, and after about 30 minutes, I began to get tired. Cocaine doesn't last that long. Jerry Gropp was with me, and he tried to hold down George's feet. George kicked him in the thumb and broke it. It seemed like he was getting stronger, or I was getting weaker. I had no choice but to tie him up, lift him up on the couch, and try to see if he was comfortable. I never felt so bad in my life thinking, here's the greatest country singer that ever lived, and I'm tying his ass up. Now, you be still, I told him. I'm going to call your manager to come pick you up. George sneered at me. I'll get you, you Conway Twitty acting son of a bitch, he said. What does that even mean? You Conway Twitty acting son of a What's that mean? He says, I'll get you, you Conway Twitty acting son of a bitch, he said. I couldn't hold back a laugh. What do you mean by that? You hit me in the face, and you kicked me in the nuts. You cuss the ladies in my house. You break my guitar player's thumb, and now you call me a Conway Twitty acting son of a bitch? I'm the one who's done a do to the getting. 
Anyway, it goes on. Uh, George finally passes out and gets sent home. There's a lot of stories like that in this book. There's stories I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard about when Waylon and Johnny Cash lived together in an apartment in Madison, Tennessee, and that's just outside of East Nashville. A lot of the people are moving there these days that can't afford to live in my old neighborhood of East Nashville. And I've been to this apartment complex and seen the apartment they lived in there. But uh, there was just one bedroom that they both slept in, Johnny Cash and Waylon Jennings sleeping in the same room. It sounded like they just had mattresses on the floor, and when one would come home, they'd have to jump over the other person's body to get to where they sleep. But they were both pilled up like crazy at the time. And I believe Johnny hid his drugs behind the medicine cabinet so Waylon couldn't find them, and Waylon hid his behind the air conditioner so Johnny couldn't find them. But they got to they got along great and uh and they got to better places in their life, which is the most important thing. But there's a story he tells about a story Waylon tells about when George Jones was on top of the world, you know, for a couple decades. And then there towards the end of the 70s, he was just kind of crashing down and he was out of money and he was about to go bankrupt and lose everything. So Waylon and Johnny got together. Waylon and Johnny Cash, they got together and went down to George Jones's bank without him knowing about it. And they talked to somebody there. And there's like, well, what, what... what can we do to where he doesn't leave, lose his house, lose his car, lose his tour bus? He's got to have a place to live, and he's got to have a way to travel around to make money. And they talked to bank people into letting them pay his bills, but they did it anonymously. They didn't want anybody to know. That was the deal. You can't tell George that we're doing it. Just let him think that some anonymous benefactor did it. And... Waylon said John Cash did the same thing for him a little earlier when he was facing the same sort of trouble. So they thought that they would do it without anybody knowing. But, you know, when your bills start getting paid and you don't know how, you probably go to your bank and start asking, what the hell's going on? And that's what George Jones did. And somebody at the bank told him that Waylon and Johnny Cash were helping him out. So the word got out that way. But it's great to hear stories about you know, friends helping each other out, friends that have the means to be able to help somebody get back on their feet, especially people who are suffering substance abuse issues and um, maybe they get to a better place in their life. And I'm sure George Jones's career was in a lot better place. I think in 1980, when he stopped loving her today, hit that probably helped him out quite a lot in a lot of different ways. If you enjoy hearing these kind of stories about Waylon, just let me know, and I'll try to tell more. Like I said, everything that I said came out of this book. A lot of the stuff that I've read in here, I never knew before. It's a lot of great history. There's so much history that gets lost that, uh, you know, unless we pick up these little tidbits and share these stories, people won't know about it. I can only imagine the stories that Waylon didn't tell. You know, somebody like Waylon walked down so many roads. He witnessed a lot of things from a few different eras. I can only imagine the, the stories he took to the grave with him. There's an African proverb. I'm going to get this messed up. I apologize. But there's an African proverb that says something to the effect of when an old man dies, it's like a large library burning to the ground. We lose that information. I think that holds true for or Waylon. But if you like these stories, let me know and I'll tell more. And um, tell me what your favorite George Jones song is. I think uh, there's a lot of great George Jones songs out there. I'll write my favorites down below. Just tell me in the comments. Subscribe to this channel, like this video, and I will see you guys soon. Take care of each other.